Welcome to Oklahoma Gardening. On today's program, integrative biology professor Kristen Baum joins host Casey Hinges to tag monarch butterflies. Extension turf grass specialist Justin Moss has fall fertilizer tips to help our fescue out next summer. And we visit a new labyrinth garden on the OSU Stillwater campus. Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance is provided by TLC, Oklahoma's leading garden center, Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, Tulsa's source for great gardens, southwoodgardencenter.com and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. We've talked a lot about monarchs this season, and now as we enter into fall, we want to focus on monarch migration. And joining us today is once again, Dr. Kristen Baum with Integrative Biology. She's an associate professor with that department. And Dr. Baum, what can you tell us about the monarch migration? Well, we're starting to see monarchs moving through Oklahoma, and we usually think of peak migration being at the very end of September, so usually around the 29th or 30th, but there's usually a 10-day window on either side, so it can be early or late depending on the conditions throughout the, the monarchs range each year. Um, and then, of course, you'll have some stragglers coming through as well, so it's really a, a much wider time period, but we're starting to see some activity um, this year. And the temperature and the wind, everything goes into that, right? It influences the timing. It does, and so in terms of the cues for the monarchs, uh, you know, the temperature and the day length and, um, and factors like that are what, what trigger them to start, start that migratory process. And why is this an important time for you in your research? Well, we do a lot of tagging, so it's really important to know uh, kind of the movement of the monarchs and then, of course, how many are making it to the overwintering grounds and where they're coming from. So tagging monarchs throughout their, their range is, is really important. Um, and so we're out in force trying to, to catch as many monarchs as we can and, and tag them as well to see what Oklahoma is contributing uh, to monarchs. And so what is involved in this process of tagging monarchs? Well, I caught a few monarchs here okay. at the um, OSU Botanic Garden a little bit earlier today. Um, and so uh, I have a glassing envelope, which is just kind of a wax paper envelope mm -hmm. that we keep them in sometimes if we're gonna collect a few to process. And that doesn't harm them, it just keeps it, them so their wings don't get beat up. It right? does, and then the, the kind of waxiness of the paper helps with that as well. So we've got a, a male monarch here. And if you- and how do you know he's a male? Um, if you look um, at the hind wings, they've got this uh, spot on the hind wing that indicates that, that it's a male. Mm -hmm. There, that little right there, and you mm -hmm. can see it on this side, but it's it's not as obvious. And so, until you're kind of used to, to working with them, it, it, it kind of helps to, to look at both sides. Um, but this is a male monarch, and so for for our research, we'll collect some data in addition to what we need to collect for for Monarch Watch. So, Monarch Watch is the organization that provides the tags, um, and um, anybody can order them. Um, uh, and we have ordered quite a few this year, so I hope, <laughs> hope you were able to, to tag um, all of the, use all of the tags. Um, and so for, for our research, we measure the, the size of the wings. Okay. Um, and you use this tool? What is this uh, tool? So these are digital calipers, okay. and so they, they just measure, measure length for us in millimeters. And so we'll measure the uh, width of the wing. And so wing and size could factor into to, you know, how well they do on migration. And so knowing of the ones we tag, you know, kind of additional information about them um, can be very helpful as well. Does that play into their age also? If they're a younger butterfly or do they come out of the chrysalis being the size that they're going to be? They're the size they're going to okay. be. Okay. So, yeah. So, uh, and then we uh, provide an estimate of, of kind of the condition of the butterfly. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't really give you an idea of age, but it could certainly give you an idea of how much they've been through. 
in, in their life and then we record the activity. So in this case, these were nectarine on some nice nectar plants at the Botanic Gardens. Um, and then we collect a tape count, count sample uh, to test for OE. So OE um, is the abbreviation for Ophryocystes electroscura, which okay. is a <laughs> spore forming protist, which sounds really complicated, but essentially if the butterflies are infected, um, it means they don't live as long and they can't fly as well. And so they're likely not going to make that migration to Mexico. Okay, so um, it's a spore that actually does harm to the living butterflies. It does. So it, it most of the time doesn't outright kill them. If they're really heavily infected, it could. Mm -hmm. But it, it, you know, by decreasing their lifespan and their flight ability, um, it can have a, a negative effect on the, the overall population. Um, and then when the females oviposit, um, they'll leave behind spores, which is how the infection continues. And so, um, and so there's lots of interest in knowing um, how those levels vary mm -hmm. um, among years and then with different regions and different, my interest is land use and, um, and management and, and things like that. Um, and there's a really simple way um, to test for OE um, and uh, citizens can contribute as well. There's a project called um, Project Monarch Health uh, where if you um, contact them, they'll send you um, fancier tape than this. <laughs> this is just, uh, just scotch tape. And if you just gently press it against the abdomen, um, it'll pull off a few scales, um, okay. and then if there's uh, spores, it'll pull those off as well. And the butterflies you lose their scales over their lifetime anyway, so it doesn't harm them and lets us release them. So it's a really easy way to, to be able to collect data um, and then also uh, let the monarchs go so we can so, tag them at the same time. And so we'll go back and look at this under the microscope. Okay, um, so it's like a little slide tell. that you can put under the microscope. It is, it is, it works well. Um, and then the last thing we're gonna do to this guy is we're going to put a tag on him and so the, the tags have a three letter and three number code. Um, and so I'm just gonna write that down here. Um, and then uh, you have to kind of carefully remove the tag and manage not to get it stuck to you um, <laughs> at the same time. Um, and where do you put it on the wing of the butterfly? Um, it's this big cell in the center here, which is called the discal cell. So mm -hmm. it's the one right there. Get it on there and then you hold it for a few seconds just to make sure that the the, the glue has adhered to the wing well. And our little guy's cooperating there for you. <laughs> he is. Um, and then there's been research to, to document that it doesn't harm the butterflies mm -hmm. and that they can still fly well. Um, and then of course there's lots of tag oh, recovery. And there he goes. And there he goes. So that's all there is to it. Now, that's all there is. Now, the measuring of their wings is something you're doing for your research and also collecting the scales. If citizens or school groups wanted to do this, is there a project where they could get involved in this also? So they can order tags from Monarch Watch okay. um, and they will get sheets of, of 25 tags and you can order different quantities. Um, and then they have a, a data sheet for you to fill out that provides the date, um, the location that you're tagging monarchs at, uh, whether it's a male or a female. And they've got excellent instructions that, that come with it as well. Um, and then. Uh, what, you're, what number you're tagging it with. And then you'll, um, you can either send in the paper copies or you can um, put it in a, a spreadsheet and email it to them as well. And then they'll post the tag returns on their website um, in, uh, in the spring uh, once they get the, the tag return. So they'll uh, contribute money uh, so that locals in Mexico, when they find tagged monarchs, they can report those tags. And so that's, that's how they're able to, to be able to, to report those tag returns. So how many are you planning on tagging this season? Well, last year we tagged 500. Um, and so we- And how many did you find out about? Uh, we found out Mexico? about eight. So eight. that sounds really low, okay. <laughs> but if anything above 1% is really good. So, you know, if you're, if you're just ordering 25 tags, you know, it might be, you know, a couple years before you get get a return, but it's still it's great data. Um, it can con contribute a lot to, to monarch conservation. Um, and so, out of our 500, we had eight um, eight that were returned. And so, we're going to try for um, 1,250 this year. Wow. So, uh, so we'll see how that goes. Um, and so, uh, so we'll keep our fingers crossed. We get to use all of our tags. So, when we're talking about monarchs migrating, how far do they fly, and how high are they up in the air? Well, they can fly over 10,000 feet. So, you know, if they're migrating through really high, um, you know, they can be, be difficult to see. Um, and on an individual basis in any one given day, you know, most monarchs are going to fly um, you know, 50 to 100 miles maybe. Um, but there is one record of a tagged monarch that made it, I think it was 265 miles. So it'd be like driving from, you know, Stillwater down to, to Dallas. And so, so they can make it quite some distance if the winds are right and, you know, kind of kind of helping them along there. Uh, but then if you think about their whole migration route to Mexico, um, you know, especially if they're up in Southern Canada, um, they can, you know, that's about 3,000 miles. So it's a very long distance, a very long way to go. Um, and they have 
have had records of, of those from southern Canada uh, making it to, to Mexico. Wow, so. okay. Well, we'll keep our eyes out for those monarchs migrating. Thank you. Okay. Here in a beautiful tall fescue lawn and as you can see where there's a little bit of shade here we've got some trees and for Oklahoma tall fescue works quite well in the shade and so a lot of times homeowners like to plant tall fescue in shaded areas of their lawn and usually what we're looking for is just to use a turf type tall fescue there's many to choose from now you may already have grass in your lawn or in the fall uh, you may be thinking about overseeding your tall fescue lawn with more tall fescue seed. So it's also the time to really start thinking about how we're going to fertilize this, supply some nutrients to the grass so that it can grow and be healthy. So before we talk about that, let's think about how does tall fescue grow and how is it adapted to Oklahoma. Well, tall fescue is a cool season grass. And basically what that means is it prefers cooler temperatures. In Oklahoma, we can have quite warm temperatures during the summer. And so tall fescue does not necessarily do well in Oklahoma during our hot and humid summers. So a lot of times it will kind of die out during the summertime and we'll have to try to rejuvenate it or revitalize it in the fall and the spring. So with this cool season tall fescue, it really prefers our fall and springs in Oklahoma and does quite well during that time. And it's also the best time to fertilize the grass. And so what we're trying to do in the fall is we want to fertilize, give it the proper nutrients so that the tall fescue can grow, be established. And really what we're trying to do is, is the unseen part below the ground. And we want to get some really deep and solid root growth during the fall, continue that through the spring, and then hopefully help it to survive the best that we can for the summer. So for these cool season tall fescues, you're gonna see lots of root growth in the fall, lots of root growth in the spring, and really zero root growth in the summer. Actually, we'll see root death in the summer. So the, best, the, the better that we can do in the fall and spring to get it prepared for summer, the better it will be during our summers. So now that we're ready to fertilize the tall fescue, what do we need to do? Well, the first step always is do a soil test. And that's uh, really easy to do. We have lots of information on that, and you can send that to your local county extension office or to the university for soil testing. We get the results back and it's going to give you how much nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium you would need to add uh, to your soil so that it would be a healthy uh, stand of turf grass or tall fescue. And so in this case, we've actually got pretty good phosphorus and pretty good potassium in our soils already. So really the only thing we need to do is add some nitrogen. So now we got to go grab the spreader out of the barn, purchase some fertilizer, and, and go to work. So, so which fertilizer do we need to buy? Well, we have several options here. And sometimes you'll see fertilizers that have uh, the three numbers on the bag all listed. So I've got a 13, 13, 13 here and a 17, 17, 17 here. And what this is telling me basically is this has 13% nitrogen, 13% uh, phosphate, and 13% potash. The 17, 17, 17 has 17% 17 of each. There's another bag I have here, it has a 464. So now I've got a little bit lower amount of nitrogen, lower, lower amount of nutrients altogether. So 4% nitrogen, 6% uh, phosphate, 4% potash. And then the, the last bag I have is actually a 4200. And so this has 42% nitrogen and it doesn't have any phosphorus or potassium or, or uh, phosphate or potash in it. And so for, for our soil test here, since we don't need the phosphorus or potassium, all we're going to do is put some nitrogen down. So I'm not going to pick these three today. I'm going to pick just the nitrogen source. Now, now even when we get narrow it down to that, it's still a little tricky. I can buy urea nitrogen, which is a 4600 formulation, and it's a 100% it's a quick release nitrogen source. What that means is when I put the nitrogen out today, it's going to quickly release over the next 30 days or so, and after that, it's pretty much all used up and gone. So for, for the fall and the spring here in this tall fescue, really what I want is a slow release nitrogen source. So this 4200 has this coating on it. It's called a polymer coated urea. And with that coating, what it does is it, is it slows down the release of the nitrogen over time. And so I could actually put out two pounds of nitrogen today with this slow release polymer coated urea, and it's slowly gonna release over the next 60, 75 days 
and just give a, a, through a through a kind of like a timed release, just give a little bit out over the next 60, 75 days. Whereas if I put out two pounds of just straight fast release urea nitrogen today, um, I would probably lose a lot of that either uh, to the atmosphere or to if it rains it would wash away and, and I would the plant would actually never be able to utilize that. So what I want to do is pick a slow release source. Now that's a little tricky too but if you read that fertilizer bag when you buy it you'll see this product has X percent fast release and X percent slow release and what you're trying to do is get a, a pretty good slow release source. So in this case I'm choosing polymer coated urea. And so now I've got my spreader ready and I've already got it calibrated and I know with that my particular spreader I can set it to a particular setting. On this one I can set it to, to setting D on this particular spreader. I can put my fertilizer in and I walk evenly spaced through my yard watching how far I throw to the right, how far I throw to the left. And I'm going back and forth and I know I'm going to put down the right rate of fertilizer for this yard. So uh, follow these tips. You're going to have a nice healthy root growth for your tall fescue for the fall and spring help you to better survive next summer. Recently we've learned about the difference between a garden maze and a garden labyrinth and today joining us is Dave Brown with OSU and you are the landscape design coordinator here and we've installed a new labyrinth on campus. Can you tell us about your design? Sure. The Labyrinth came about as part of the wellness initiative here on campus. Uh, the campus is really making a strong push towards providing spaces that help with uh, all of those aspects of wellness. Uh, being on a campus, uh, we, we thought mental health was a big, a pretty big deal. You know, there's tests, there's deadlines, and there's all of those things. And so we wanted something, uh, a space that could help us address that. Uh, there's a few criteria in uh, having a labyrinth, and, and one of those is use of sacred geometry. Uh, I like one of the definitions which uh, defines sacred geometry as geometry found in nature. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that would be an, an excellent opportunity to use Fibonacci, his sequence. Fibonacci was a medieval mathematician. Uh, he, he basically was able to find a sequence that kept repeating in nature. So what Fibonacci sequence is, is it's a sequence that shows an exponential growth. The reason that I also decided to use that is because there's a lot of studies on nature, mm -hmm. landscape, and mental health. And being a health initiative, uh, I felt like that was a great way to tie wellness and what we do with campus beautification together. Now, you mentioned that there's three different uh, points to wellness. Can you elaborate on those as well? I, I can, and in fact, that's one of the, the reasons I chose the design that I did, is there's three sides. Uh, it's mental health, physical health, and spiritual health as well. Um, it's, it's a belief that goes back to some ancient cultures that, that state um, that these three aspects of health are tied together. So. Mm -hmm. If we're healthy mentally, we're healthy spiritually, we'll be healthy physically, and, and so on, and all, all of those combinations. And this is all part of OSU trying to be the healthiest campus, correct? Correct. Um, yeah. So, is, of course, as the designer, you're not here all the time explaining this, and so you've got some interpretation for people. As we walk through this garden, um, can you kind of tell us how people can learn about the Fibonacci number as they're going through this? Um, yes, so the sequence uh, or, or the, the way to get through the labyrinth, it looks pretty complicated and it's, it's really not. I think people will be pleased to find. Um, if you just start following the numbers, we have them uh, labeled here with Roman numerals. Mm -hmm. And so we can go to Roman numeral one and then turn and go to Roman numeral two. And so what you'll find is that there's really only one way through a labyrinth. Mm -hmm. A labyrinth is different than a maze because there should only be one clear way in, one clear way out. We're not trying to confuse people. Right. Um, but in this, this particular case, we're doing this so we can help people have kind of a meandering walk through that labyrinth. But uh, unless you go backwards, you can only go forwards and it'll move you through the space. And how many numbers are there? How many steps are there through this labyrinth? There's 12 stages that you can go to. Okay. All right. And so as we go through this, 
We're supposed to be taking in the moment and kind of enjoying it. How long should you be in this labyrinth? Well, they recommend that you stay in labyrinths about 20 minutes. And in this one, that's a pretty small space. We, we uh, had the opportunity to build here and it's not quite as large as we want. And we also wanted to make sure that the paths were wide enough that they could accommodate wheelchairs and walkers and, and whoever wanted to use this labyrinth. So in this particular one, the way we have it set up is on the 12th stage, mm -hmm. it exits right back where it begins. And so what we found is if you go through about four to five circuits, depending on how fast you're going, that's about 20 minutes. Um, another way you can stay in the labyrinth if, if you so choose is the benches, which uh, allows you to stop, contemplate, meditate. Uh, it also serves, because we are a school, we, wanna, we want it to double as a study space as well. So this garden squeezed into a small space, as you mentioned. We're between two buildings and between two parking lots. What did you do as far as the design goes to help mitigate the sound? Well, we wanted to mitigate the sound, but we also wanted to mitigate the side as well. We want people to feel comfortable within the space and, and be uh, feel free to use it. One of the ways we did that is behind you'll see magnolias that we're going to allow to grow together in a, a green screen. These magnolias, it's what they call a spalier, where you take a tree and you grow it kind of like a vine in a two-dimensional form. Mm -hmm. These particular trees are little gem magnolias. Um, and you'll see we stopped a little bit short and carried on with the trellis here. Mm -hmm. The reason we did that is we didn't want to, to put a competing tree underneath the, the drip zone of this tree right here and felt like it'd be a lower impact but it still allow us to, to keep that screen going across. So on this uh, screen behind, you'll find a kibia or chocolate, chocolate vine, vine. Mm -hmm. right? And uh, in the ground, that's a Thorndale English ivy. And eventually those two will both be on the, the trellis and the way we see it is may the best vine win. <laughs> but Thorndale's a great one because it, it is kind of known for a very uh, pronounced vein and so it's kind of cool because you you get that contrast of the vein of the white and the green in that leaf. Excellent and I see you have also planted some auto lucans over here along the edge that will grow a little bit taller and help hide the bikes. <laughs> yes. So between two buildings here there's a neat perspective that a lot of times people don't realize. Um, you can actually go up in both of the buildings in Morrill Hall and look down on this labyrinth as well. You can. You, you can go up into Morrill Hall. Um, what I love about those picture windows looking down on the garden is you get a really good vantage point. Uh, you're, you're able to see the pattern and how it came together a little bit more. Um, and it's, it's actually quite a beautiful window and quite a beautiful view to do that. Um, can you tell us a little bit about some of the other things that you see in here? We've got some hydrangeas here. Can you tell me about this? It's a new one, right? It is, and this is one I'm pretty excited about because, as you know, we had a pretty hot summer. Uh -huh. We planted this in the heat of the summer, and, and it's doing great. It's called Tiny Tough Stuff. Okay. It's hydrangea serrata. Um, it's a mountain hydrangea. Had a brilliant blue flower. Um, Right now, the little bit of flower you see it has turned pink, and, and that means that we need to acidify the soil just a little bit to, to get back to the blue. Um, do you want blue for a specific reason? I do. Okay. Uh, I, we've used a lot of blues, and we've used a lot of darker greens. I, I have used some white because I, I, I like kind of the cleanliness, the purity of the color. But we used a little color theory, too, in helping to mitigate the space. And so what we want to do is we want to uh, psychologically tone, tone it down using darker shades of greens and blues. And so when you step into that space, it, it feels more calming to you. Very nice. And we've got a great structure here in the center that we need to mention. Um, and it actually plays up that Fibonacci number again. It does, so this, this is more literal, but this is Fibonacci spiral. We arrayed it around and we're gonna grow clematis up, up the structure so that it will look like a tree. Um, in this particular case, most, most of the time people don't like the legginess of the clematis. We're counting on it because <laughs> we, want, we want the, uh, the foliage up into the tree. 
Very nice. And can we talk about the stone that we're walking on? It's beautiful stone. Is this native? This is from Oklahoma, so from southeast Oklahoma. It's a sandstone called Wild Horse. We, we love the stone for the space because while we were trying to match the Bartlett with the structure, we were trying to match the coloration to the aged limestone of Morrill Hall as well. Um, also love the patterns because it gives some, somebody walking through the labyrinth something to look at and, and kind of keep their mind active. Very nice. Well, it's a beautiful labyrinth and garden as well. And thank you for sharing with us. And I would encourage our viewers next time they're here on campus to take a walk through this labyrinth. Next week on Oklahoma Gardening, we find out how to create our own labyrinth garden. We get an update on how to deal with rose rosette disease and what is being done to find a solution. Casey has some beautiful rose alternatives and mums the word for having some fun with pumpkins. So join us then for more TV you'll grow to love. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagardening.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We wish to thank our generous underwriters, TLC Garden Centers, Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is provided by Pond Pro Shops, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, and the Oklahoma Horticultural Society. We hope you enjoyed this video. It's part of our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. You can also find even more videos on our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel. And join us on social media for great gardening tips, photos, and discussion.